Good morning, South family. Welcome to our time of prayer for Wednesday, September 21st. We want to begin with sympathies to a couple families. First, to the family of Lib Sessoms. You might remember Ross Sessoms, her husband, died just a couple weeks ago, and Lib passed away this past Saturday here in Spartanburg. Uh, there's a graveside service on Saturday, October 1st at Green Lawn Cemetery. And then Annette Daly's sister, Rhonda Fleming, uh, from Fort Mill, South Carolina, passed away on Friday, September 16th. Uh, pray for John Gaston. John uh, is having some issues with his heart, and he had one test yesterday. He's due to have the other test today, and then they'll be waiting for results to see what the next step is for them. We do have a praise report from Jan McClure. Uh, she received a report that she's cancer-free. So we're just rejoicing with Jan and Malcolm and for the care that she's gotten over these past several years dealing with her cancer. It's good to hear that report. Uh, Judy Mobley Webner, a lot of us know Judy. She grew up here at Morningside, and uh, her daughter's my daughter-in-law. But uh, Judy's having some tests this week and asked us if we would pray for her also. And today, uh, Elena Baston, Connor's wife, I know she's been having some neurological problems, so she's finally going to get an MRI that she needs. She's on some medication, and uh, they just want to make sure if there's anything else going on that they can track that down. Pray for Karen Frady if you knew her situation, I think maybe two or three months ago, she broke the second metatarsal in her foot. And last week, she broke the third metatarsal in her foot. So please pray for Karen as she deals with that. Then Regina Martin is going to have a valve replaced. And she's going to have further tests on the 27th. And then another evaluation on October 3rd before they do the surgery. Pray for Bud Smith. A lot of us know Bud. Uh, they were members here at Morningside a long time ago. And Bud has been through cancer once, but the cancer has returned. And they ask for our prayers. And then Lynn Alexander's brother, David Brady, uh, was kicked in the eye by a horse. And uh, they thought he had a detached retina, but they were able to repair that. And so we're praising the Lord that the healing will take place for David Brady. And then pray for our members who are in the assisted living areas and nursing homes, homebound members. Um, it's good to see them and visit them, but I know they miss being at their church. So please Remember them in your prayers, along with folks who are still dealing with COVID, and uh, pray for our country. Um, there's a lot of things going on as we get closer to that November date of, of the elections. Uh, so pray for our nation's capital and our state and local and government officials. Pray for those who continue to uh, work with refugees in the Ukraine. I uh, just heard yesterday morning from Tony Shaw that Pastor Gustav uh, is getting ready to make a, a run to take things into the Ukraine. And they said, please pray for their safety. So if you would do that, I know he would appreciate it. Then pray for Pastor Stephen as he leads our study tonight. Let's pray together. Father God, we just come before you thanking you for your love. Father, for the power of prayer in our lives as we uh, seek your face, Lord, as we intercede on behalf of those in our church, especially praying for the family of Lib Sessoms and, uh, and her death. And pray for the uh, service on October 1st. Uh, we just pray for Annette Daly and her family and the loss of her sister in Fort Mill. Lord, we pray for all those who are in uh, rehab. We have quite a few now. And just thank you for uh, those folks that take care of them each and every day during that time of rehab. We just praise you for Jan McClure's good report of being cancer-free, Lord. We pray for John Gaston as he's taking these tests. Help them to find the answers that they need, Lord, to help him with his issues with his heart. We lift up Judy Mobley and Elena as they have a test and the MRI. And especially for Karen Frady, Lord, as she has to deal with uh, that broken bone in her foot again. Lord, we just pray that you bring healing into her life. And for Regina, as she waits for her surgery, we just lift her up to, do, to you. We pray for Bud Smith, Lord. We just love Bud and... Just, uh, his, he's always got a smile on his face. He's such an encouragement to uh, others, if you know him. And we just pray for the return of his cancer, that while they can deal with that once again, and bring him back to good health. And especially, we praise you, Lord, and thank you for uh, David Brady, and that he was able to uh, get the retina reattached, and that there's healing going to be taking place in his life. 
And we do miss those who are our members and they are living in assisted living facilities or homebound. Lord, and can't come to church, but we thank you for their prayers. Thank you for their concerns. And we pray for Pastor Gustav and those who are going to make this trip into the Ukraine soon and just put your hedge of protection around them and the time that they have to pray with and help refugees and be ministering to those in the Ukraine, Father. We pray for Pastor Stephen as he brings this study tonight. Just bless him, Lord, as we once again look at your word. In Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. God bless you and have a good week. Thank you for joining us this Wednesday. Today our hymn is, It Is Well With My Soul. We invite you to sing along. study tonight in just a few minutes, uh, we're going to be talking about the book of Zechariah. But I wanted to share with you a change that is coming up in the month of October. Uh, for the past few years, ever since COVID, we have been uh, having a virtual prayer meeting on Wednesday nights. Uh, but at the end of September, uh, next week, in fact, we will have our last virtual prayer meeting. Uh, we are going to be transitioning to having two shorter videos that you will see on a Tuesday and on a Thursday. I haven't finalized on what we're going to call those uh, exactly yet, but I did want you to be aware that that change is coming, and we believe it will help us to not only have a uh, stronger presence uh, on the internet, but we also believe it might be a, a greater encouragement to you to be able to have uh, several messages through the week instead of just one. 
So let's talk about Zechariah as we uh, move forward. Zechariah is one of the longest texts in the entirety of the Minor Prophets. In fact, when we think about his ministry, it begins with the rebuilding of the temple, which he focuses on, but he really looks to the far future for the greater restoration that is coming, which explains perhaps why he has more to say than some of the other prophets, uh, because he is focused on such a, a, a larger perspective of not only what is right now, but what is yet to come. Uh, his Hebrew uh, title and, and his name actually means Jehovah remembers. And uh, when we are thinking about that idea, uh, he was a young man uh, that came likely with the exiles back uh, from uh, the uh, cities of Babylon uh, and back to the promised land. And he may have been uh, one of the youngest people that were in that party. Uh, it tells us that uh, he was a contemporary of Haggai as we are looking at that, but it also reminds us uh, that he was a younger person if we look at Zechariah 2, uh, verse number 4. Um, and as we are, are looking at that idea that maybe he's a younger man, uh, we see that there are several generations of his family that are listed. It uh, tells us in 1 1 that he is described as the son of Berechiah and that he is also the grandson of Edo. Edo being one of the priests that returned with Zerubbabel uh, in Nehemiah 12.4. So he may have even been born in the promised land. Uh, but one way or the other, as we are looking at Zechariah, he uh, tells us later on in 12.16 that he was the head of his household, meaning that both his father and his grandfather were deceased. And as they began his time as a prophet, uh, he was uh, preaching about the rebuilding of the temple. And uh, he completed uh, that uh, rebuilding, or that rebuilding was completed, and he likely wrote the rest of his prophecy as much as 40 years later. Ezra mentions both Haggai and Zechariah as uh, we talk about the rebuilding of the temple as critical people involved in that. And most likely, when Jesus speaks of Zechariah in Matthew 23, 35, he is speaking about this Zechariah. Uh, one of the final of the prophets that was preaching, teaching, and writing in the Old Testament. And we read that the Zechariah that Jesus speaks of was martyred on the temple grounds by a mob uh, that was upset at some of the things uh, that he had proclaimed from the Lord. Zechariah's date is one that is very easy for us because he actually dates his prophecies much like Haggai did in the beginning of his ministry. Uh, he uh, records his first one after uh, two months after Haggai would have recorded his first prophecy, sometime around 520 BC. And the last of his prophecies is uh, dated at, uh, or the last of his dated prophecies, I should say, uh, is around 518 BC. And we find that in chapter 7. But it's likely that chapters 9 through 14 represent a much later date of composition. One of the reasons we would say uh, that that's the case is that he stops dating his prophecies. Uh, and then he goes on uh, to speak about some things in ways that are a little different than the way he had spoken about them earlier. And particularly, he refers to Greece. Uh, it is referenced there in uh, chapter 9, verse 13. And that would be somewhat around the time of 480 B.C. when they were uh, repelling the Persians and Darius from their region. So the, the Greeks were on the rise, and Zechariah actually records this. As we look at the plan for Zechariah, it is a, a very unique sort of plan because Zechariah has visions, and they are very important, these visions are. Uh, and the, he writes from a perspective where he is anticipating Jesus, uh, but he has a much clearer view, perhaps, than the others in the end times. I mean, in the Old Testament, about the end times. And so when he is talking about the coming of Christ, he speaks about that, and he doesn't make a large distinction between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. The whole of what we find in the beginning uh, chapters is a call to repentance. And that is followed, uh, as we are looking at it, by eight visions. And these visions begin with the horsemen, uh, that you may uh, be thinking about as associated with Revelation. Well, Zechariah speaks about the horsemen that are in the world right now first. He also speaks about the four horns, 
And he, he speaks about how uh, these are made by craftsmen, four craftsmen, and they're scattered. Uh, and uh, as we look at that, that is an important image that he is seeing that is talking a little bit about the nations. Then he uh, talks about a measuring line, very similar to some of the things that we read perhaps in the book of Amos, where there is this measuring line that is uh, deciding as to whether people are uh, ready and repentant or they are in the place where they do not measure up. Uh, then he moves on to this wonderful picture of uh, Joshua, the high priest, in dirty clothes. And the Lord himself uh, is the one who says, Take off those dirty clothes. I've taken your iniquity away. Give him new clothes because he uh, has been forgiven. Uh, that picture is one that is very much like what we expect in the New Testament. We then see the lampstand, and you saw a couple of slides ago, the picture of the lampstand. This lampstand is very important, and it is very much a part of what prophecy will be about in the, the coming uh, books uh, of the New Testament, in Revelation particularly, when it talks about the lampstands that are there in the first chapters of Revelation. This is a reference to that as well, and it talks about the lampstand in the midst of the two trees. Then there is the flying scroll, and, and it is a scroll that has a curse that is associated with it. Uh, after that, we read about the ephoth basket, a basket that would hold an ephoth, and uh, it is carried away uh, with the a wicked woman inside of it, uh, talking about the, the sin, and maybe even that is where the reference to, uh, in Revelation, the whore of Babylon comes from. And then there's the vision of four chariots, uh, four chariots of judgment that are coming, uh, almost the way that we would expect uh, to hear the, the sky breaks forth uh, and open and is rolled up like a scroll and the trumpets are sounding and the Lord returns. The, these are pictures, visions that Zechariah have. And even as he is, is seeing these things and knowing that there is a close and a near fulfillment, there is a far fulfillment that is yet to come. Uh, we, we see here this interesting picture that comes right after that where Joshua the high priest is crowned also as king, anticipating what will happen when Jesus is both high priest, prophet, and king. All of these things are brought together. And then there is this fast that results in a feast uh, that comes in the, the book, finalized by these oracles concerning the coming king, particularly that the chief shepherd is going to appear, and when he does, the sheep will be saved. So all of this leads us to think just a little bit about uh, the purpose of this book. And for some reason, uh, there's a picture at the bottom of the slide that is, some, uh, that is uh, sneaking in there. But when you look at the purpose, it is important for us to realize that God's judgment will one day bring an apocalypse. It'll bring a day like no other day. It'll be the final day, the final opportunity for anyone to be able to, to trust the Lord will happen before that day. And when that day comes, it will be everlasting too late. As it says in the slide, before the apocalypse, God's mercy brings forth a Messiah. And the Messiah is there to say, you don't have to face judgment. You don't have to face the apocalypse. You can be forgiven and cleansed and set free. And genuine worship, as we are looking at what we read throughout Zechariah, is a worship that involves sincere repentance and trust. Interestingly, out of all of the Old Testament, uh, and particularly the book of the Twelve, the New Testament alludes to this book, to Zechariah, 67 times, and a number of them come in the book of Revelation. And all of what we see there and what we are talking about there, we see some of the best pictures and best things that are discussed about Jesus that we anticipate and that he fulfills. He comes on the back of a donkey, as you see in the picture at the top uh, right-hand corner. And there is the phrase that we find about striking the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. What we, we understand that to be exactly what happened when Jesus was crucified. All of his disciples scattered away from him. But we also know that he is coming again and that we should be ready for his second coming when he arrives. And that, of course, we know is yet to come, which leads us to maybe the application that we need to be thinking about. 
And there's so many passages that are great in Zechariah. I could have picked from a number of them to preach and to teach about. But Zechariah 12, at the very end of the book, lays out this very potent picture for us. It says in 12.10, And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him who they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. On that day, the mourning in Jerusalem will be as great as the mourning for Hadad Ramon in the plain of Megiddo. The land shall mourn in each family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself, their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself, and their wives by themselves. The family of the house of Levi by itself and their wives by themselves. The family of, Shema, of the Shemites by itself and their wives by themselves. And all the families that are left, each by itself and their wives by themselves. On that day, there shall be a fountain open for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. This description of mourning is one that begins with this confession that the people have pierced one for their transgressions. There's a real sense of loss, of mourning, as if the people have lost one of their own. It's a sorrow for what has happened that is greater than a worldly sorrow that just regrets being caught or, or having to deal with the difficult issues. It's a, it's a godly sorrow that says, I am sorry that I am responsible for your death. There's this realization that each person, not just a family, not just a house, not just one leader, but each person must repent and turn to the Messiah, to Christ. And finally, it tells us that there is a fountain that cleanses from sin. If we would repent and we would turn to the Lord, there is cleansing and forgiveness of sins. Zechariah teaches and preaches that. And he wants us to do that before it is everlasting too late. And if we don't apply anything else from the book of Zechariah, that needs to be what we apply. That we would seek Jesus while we can. That we would serve Christ while we are able. And that we would share Christian love before it's everlasting too late. Friends, that's our prayer for you. And that's our prayer each and every day here at Morningside. Thank you so much for listening. And God bless you.